chapter seven, which has to do with process strategy and sustainability. We're gonna talk about different types of production processes during this chapter. We're also gonna calculate crossover points for different processes. And so what the crossover points are is where you go from say a small machine to a medium sized machine or medium to a large machine based on fixed and variable costs. There are four uh, types of basic strategies and companies will typically use all four or a combination. The process uh, strategy is for low volumes and high variety. A lot of textbooks refer to this as job shops. And you can see some examples like a, a restaurant, a hospital, things along that line where you have lot sizes typically of one or very small amounts and everyone is unique. You then have a repetitive process and I think the best way to understand this would be things like making automobiles, as you can see motorcycles, like Harley Davidson, Kawasaki, Suzuki for their motorcycles. Product focus is where you have a combination of higher volumes and there is some, uh, some differentiation. Again, I think the best to understand this is you can see like a bakery where they would make batches of buns or bread or things along that line. Beer, so like Big Rock Breweries would be a good example in Calgary. Frito-Lay, where they would make potato chips, but they have different types or uh, seasonings. Then you have mass customization. The first company that was able to really do this well is Dell Computers. If anybody's ever ordered a Dell computer, especially a desktop, you can customize the video card. You can select a specific type of hard drive, uh, certain whatever type of RAM you want, or and they'll build it to your needs. And everybody can then ask us buy a different computer. They do have pre pre done ones, which would be a repetitive process. So if you say, well, I'm not very computer savvy, I don't know different types of hard drives with the or different types of video cards, just give me a computer. Then that would be a repetitive process. So they have that, but you can also go in and be very specific if you want a certain type of RAM, like I said, even certain t different manufacturers of different uh, hard drives. So, and that's very difficult to achieve. Uh, the automotive industry has been literally trying for decades to do that and has yet to achieve that, where you can actually order something and get it quickly and at no really additional cost. Nike has gotten very close to that. You can go in and make your own custom shoes on their website. You can scan logos or graphics and they'll put them on the shoe for you and they'll deliver it fairly quickly. I think it's three weeks or so. And it's not like it's triple the price. There is a bit of a premium for that, but it's, uh, I think it's like 20% more, something along that line. But it gives you great flexibility. I'm going to focus more on, there's a table coming up. I'm going to go over that. So I'm not going to uh, go into more detail about process strategy, etc. So I'll, when we have the table coming up, I'll focus on talking about the different fixed and variable costs, skill levels of your workers, etc. And again, you don't have to use either process or repetitive. Within your organization, you can do both or all four. All right. So I'll skip ahead here and let you have a chance to read that at your leisure. This is the table that I was referring to, and I'm not going to go through. I'm fairly sure there are 10 uh, rows. I've already talked about uh, row number one where the process uh, strategy is to have low volumes but very high variety. And the other extreme is you have high volume, but in this case also have high variety. And the two in the middle are mixtures, so it's a spectrum, as you'll see. 
from say low variety to high variety things along that line low volume to high volume that's the biggest difference in row number one you go from low volume on the left to high volume on the right equipment the equipment when you have high variety needs to be general purpose equipment so a, something that i'm fairly sure you have in your home would be a screwdriver a screwdriver can be used for a multitude of things depending on the tip and a lot of screwdrivers even have replaceable tips but it can be it's not just specific to one type of uh, particular use so you wouldn't have a very specialized piece of equipment because you have low volumes so because it's only good at doing one thing now on mass customization you have a product that has rapid changeover I saw a piece of equipment one time. It was it had different drill bits on the end of it. I believe about 38, if I remember correctly. And what it did was if you had, it, it would cut into a piece of wood, say a logo. So this company did work for like companies like Coca-Cola. So if Coca-Cola wanted their logo in the uh, wood, they would pay this company and they would, they would uh, cut that logo in there. The Fritole came along and said, we want our logo or cut into the wood. They could do that. And very quickly, it was computerized. So your computer is has rapid changeover. So an example of a piece of equipment that has quick changeover is your computer because you can quickly go between Word, PowerPoint, go on the Internet, etc. Now, in row number three, you need operators that are very broadly skilled because they need to be able to do a variety of things. So an example could be a mechanic. A mechanic can do an oil change, then the next job is changing brake pads, then the next job is changing transmissions, etc. Now, when you have products that are much more standardized, you don't need somebody who can do a multitude of things. Even with instructors, we have some instructors who can teach accounting, finance, supply chain, statistics, a wide variety. Even though those instructors don't get paid more, there's usually a lot more work for them, as opposed to some instructors who can just teach like intro financial accounting. They can't even teach managerial accounting. So you want flexibility with your workers. The last point that I want to make here, and this is just, I'm not, this is a lot of information in the 10 rows. I'm just trying to highlight the four or so that are the most important. And you just have to get a feel for it. It's not going to specifically ask you, like row number eight, repetitive process. You just get a sense of how they're different. Row number 10, fixed costs. With the process, which is also, like I said earlier, very much known as a job shop, you have low fixed costs and high variable costs. And with the other end of the spectrum, the mass customization, you can have fairly high fixed costs, which would be a lot of equipment, but you then get low variable costs. And that's going to be a major theme of this chapter where in one case you might have high fixed costs, you better have low operating costs, also known as variable costs. Then you also have a situation where it has low fixed costs, but your operating costs can be higher. A specific example would be photocopiers. You have a small photocopier, so it has low fixed cost, but to print on it is more expensive because it doesn't have a high volumes like economies of scale. So that would be an example of where you'd have low fixed costs, but high operating costs. Then you have a nice big piece of equipment, a high end photocopier that has, it's very expensive, but it produces a lot of pages very quickly. And so the operating costs are very low per page. So the cost of 
print per page. Now, which one should you buy? It depends on your volumes. If you're a small little business, you don't print a lot, then you would probably select low up, low fixed costs and deal with the fact that your cost per page is higher. But if you're a very high uh, volume place, like a printing uh, uh, service, then you would pick, because of the difference in volumes, you pick something that where the piece of equipment could produce a lot more, but and it was much more expensive to purchase, but the cost per page was very low. And we're going to go through several examples from chapter number seven to actually calculate those numbers. So you can see here's some graphs and some diagrams just to give you a visual on what this looks like. So to emphasize one more time, when you have low fixed costs, you have high variable costs. When you have high fixed costs, you better have low variable costs. So you can see the blocks at the bottom of the crossover charts are the fixed costs. The slope of the line is the variable costs. Because if you had something that had high fixed costs and high variable costs, why bother? Right? So, and it depends on the volumes. As you can see when they, in the lower ch chart where there's crossover points. And we will use the software for calculating that. Sustainability. The four R's, resources, recycling. So the resources are the resources that you use that they're sustainable, like using electricity in, instead of like natural gas. Recycling, which you're quite familiar with. So even cars get recycled. Regulations, following regulations for pollution or discharge of your waste. And then, of course, even your, your reputation. In today's world, you do not want to get a reputation for being a polluter or not uh, ethically sourced. Organizations are very much pushing that. Starbucks was one of the first companies that I'm aware of in the uh, for coffees. They would pay the people, the coffee producers, the people who, grew, who grow the beans, they would pay them a livable wage. Even I've seen recently advertisements with McDonald's that they are advertising that their, their McCafe coffees are ethically sourced. And they point out that they pay the people who are making or growing the product a livable wage again because otherwise those people cannot feed their families and they may grow other products which are less desirable for the society in general so you can see resources are we're trying to reduce the amount of resources so reduce packaging reduce like the thickness of the paper uh, or just come out with a package that doesn't use as much uh, plastic or things along that line. Recycling, you're again, you're very familiar with. So, uh, and re reuse it, re reuse the waste. I gave an example in an earlier lecture about a company where there's overspray, and what they would do is rather than just throwing that out or letting it run into the sewer system, they would re they would reprocess it, and filter it, and then use it again. Regulations, laws for transportation, even things like noise, making loud noises, etc. And you have to follow these rules. They can be laws, they can be bylaws, etc. Reputation, uh, having a negative uh, consequence can be bad for business. Years ago, there was a company in Sudbury, Ontario, where they were having. Um, smoke from their uh, nickel operations go up into the atmosphere. It was uh, acidic and it was killing trees in a, in a wide area and it was bad for the environment. So they got a very negative reputation. Even in my hometown, we had that where they, the uh, we call it smelter smoke. So it would come up into the atmosphere. It smelled like rotten eggs because of the sulfur and stuff. 
but that sulfur would mix with uh, the moisture in the air, fall onto the ground, and it was called acid rain and would kill vegetation. So you don't want those kind of reputations. And that's the end of chapter number seven.